Hi, I'm Marge Charmoli, and I'm from St. Paul. Welcome to Buy Cities, a program by, for, and about the Buy Plus community and our friends and allies. If you're just tuning in for the first time, we are the longest running show in the history of the world on bisexuality, so we're pleased to have you. And if you've been here before, welcome back. Uh, my co-host, Dr. Anita Kozan, is not with us tonight. She's on vacation, but we'll return for future shows. So as we get started, one of my favorite things about doing this show is I always get to talk to very interesting people, and tonight is no exception. Um, I would beg to question that hardly any of us who have ever come out have come out in a four-page article in the city newspaper. And our guest tonight is that maybe one in a million, maybe one in 10 million people who, when she decided to come out, uh, came out in an article in the St. Paul Pioneer Press in 1983. So I am very pleased to introduce to you Susan Kimberly, who came out as a trans person in 1983 in St. Paul. And we'll talk about that, but more importantly, she has written a play about her life, which will be playing shortly at the History Theater in St. Paul. So we want to showcase her life story and the play tonight. So, Susan Kimberly, how exciting to have you on the it's show. It's really great to be here, Marge. Yeah. We, we, we used to hang out a little more than we have Yeah, lately. we did. You know, back in the days when we were trying to rock and roll around City Hall, you were the T and I was the B, and we had to ring bells to get recognition. Yeah, and there were all those G and L's, but. Yeah, 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 all many, the G and L's, not, not yeah. Not many of us B and T's. Yeah, yeah. I remember at one meeting when they kept saying G and L and gay and lesbian, you leaned over to me and said, Marge, I think we need to have bells, you and me, so that we can ring the, <laughs> the BT. But, you know, there was a funny part about those days. Is my role was to make a speech about how we were working for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender human rights. Yes. And GLBT didn't cut it, because if you can't say the words gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender, what's your problem? Yeah, yeah. So say the words, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. And I used to go all over town till I got everyone to just trippingly say, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. And now there's more letters that we've got to remember. Oh, I know. It's alphabet soup, isn't it? Yeah, well, and, and it should be. Yeah. And right before the show, we were talking about uh, today, the day that we're filming, is National Non-Binary Day. I am Binary Day. So, you know, that's, the language is changing all the time. Yeah, it, it, it continues to evolve. I can't keep up anymore. Well, I can't either. Every six months it does, yeah. you know. So let me just, I, got, I have to show the camera here. This article that came out in 1983 in the St. Paul Dispatch, that's what it was called back then, four pages, four full pages. So you said that, I mean, this is historic about anybody's story. Well, I, I need to tell you a little backstory. Yes, I, please now do. Now that I'm a playwright, I can use terms like backstory. All right, all right. Um, the first reporter that got my story, that is the first reporter who found out about what was going on in my life in 1983, was Dane Smith. Okay. And Dane made an amazing decision. Dane decided that my story was my business, that I was no longer an elected official, Okay. And so he would let it go. So the first time that a reporter got the story, he buried it. He did. When incredible would that have been? thing. That was in 1983. 1983, okay. The next reporter who got it was Don Del Fiaco, who is one of the writers in that, in that piece. Uh -huh. And Don did what a reporter should do. Uh -huh. And then Don went to his editor and said, do you know what's going on with Bob Sylvester's life? Okay. He, so we may He's need to give the backdrop Susan on Kimberly. that. Okay, Bob Sylvester becomes Susan Kimberly. Okay. So he went to his editor. His editor said, well, you know, he, she isn't a public figure anymore. Uh -huh. Maybe it's not a public story. And so I met with the editor, and it was Jack Rhodes and Don Effenberger. We had drinks at the Hotel St. Paul. All right. And they said, if you don't want to do this story, we'll let it go. But we need to tell you, if anyone else does the story, we will too. Oh, okay. So I said, well, I guess, I guess on that on that you basis. You by the short hairs on that one, huh? That's an offer I can't refuse. Yeah, so I yeah. said, let's do the story. Okay. So we did it, and I didn't have any idea it was going to turn into what it turned into. Yeah. But it's an incredibly 
sensitive, kind, understanding presentation in my life. And um, I, I am honored that I got that kind of treatment from my local newspaper. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure that it made a huge difference in my uh, coming out into the community. Would you have ever anticipated, I mean, you at that time had been known as Bob Sylvester, president of the St. Paul City Council. Would you have ever imagined that you would get an article like that or the response that you got from people that, you know, they were the movers and shakers in St. Paul? No, I, no, I didn't. I, I thought it was going to be, whatever happened, I was going to be in deep trouble. Ooh, okay. And instead, it was, um, it was a very warm reception. Now, there was, in the background, uh -huh. there was another backstory, and that was all, all right. the people who didn't feel that generous about my story. Ooh, okay. And in the play, there's one scene where okay. we find out how that played out. Okay, so we probably, do you want to keep that a secret so people will come to the play yeah, and absolutely. see it? Or do you no, want to, all right, we, we got to give them a teaser. Kinda, yeah, can't tell them too much. Yeah, yeah, give them enough to. The play, if, do you want to talk a little yeah, bit about course. the play yeah, for yeah, me? Yeah, 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 of course. So imagine if all your dreams came true. All right. And that's, the play is really about that. In okay. my life, my dreams did come true. Growing up as a little boy in St. Paul, I wanted to become a woman. Okay. When I was 10 years old, Christine Jorgensen came out. Okay. And uh, it was in 1952. Okay. And that was the first time I knew there was anyone else in the world that felt the way I did. Oh. So did you even have a, I mean, who had a word for it back then or just? There was you know, no word for right. it back then. Transsexual was a, a word coined uh, following Christine Jorgensen's coming out. All right. And it was uh, created by the sort of the New York um, uh, coalition that was dealing with transgender identities at that <laughs> okay, time. All right. But there was no words for it at all that right. time. So I sort of followed Christine's life and there were others that followed. But I didn't really think that I could really actualize my dreams. Yeah. But then I learned that your own true nature, and gender was certainly a big part of your own oh, true course, nature. Yeah. Your own true nature is not a dream. It is a force. Okay. And it is a force that drives one to action. Wow. Um, hopefully it's positive action. And in yeah. my case, yeah. in 1984, I gave up my life as the former president of the city council, as an investment banker, as May Sylvester's husband, and became Susan Kimberly. Wow. As I would put it, Superman became Lois Lane, which <laughs> is the title of my play. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So then I found that there was another side of the story. Okay. The dreams were great. I got to wear the clothes I always wanted to wear. I got the right pronouns for the first time in my life. Life was great. Uh -huh. And at, but on the other hand, there was another side of it that was a little darker. There okay. was glass ceilings, there was dirty jokes, there okay. were, there was those things to live with. So eventually I came to the, to the conclusion that I needed to go and have a conversation with Bob Sylvester, the guy I used to be. All right. And really have a heart to heart with him and figure out what we were gonna do with what, where we were in life. Okay, where, when about would that be in terms 1989, of? 1989. 1989. October. October, okay found him in, on a beach at Fort Ross, California. <laughs> right. He was living life as a fading memory, as he describes it. He All right. was still smoking his Cuban cigars, he still had his classic cars, All right. but he was a fading memory. All right. And he taught me a lot about life wow. and suggested that he had become his dream come true and I should figure out my own dreams and go make them happen. Great conversation. My favorite parts of the play are when Susan and Bob are sitting on that beach talking to one another. That is awesome. And so uh, what a powerful, I mean, as some people might call it spiritual, whatever. I mean, what an awakening, though. It was, uh, well, the play has been a long time in coming. I had the first draft, <coughs> excuse me, the first draft of this play was done in 1990. Okay. Had a big party at my house. I think you were there. Yeah, it was your birthday party, I think. Yeah, and uh, yeah. we had a big party and celebrated the first draft of the play, and uh -huh. I took the first draft of the play over to Jack Ruler, and Jack Ruler said it was awful. Oh, shame <laughs> he said, on him. <laughs> he said, uh -huh. but he said, when you think you have this, is, when you think this is the best play that's ever been written, come back and see me. 
Well, I didn't come back and see him, but Ron Peluso took a look at it a couple of years ago and said, you know, I think we could turn this into a play. And Ron Peluso is? is the artistic director of the History Theater. All right. Or the Herstory Theater. The Herstory your... Theater, yes, because they're doing Herstory yeah, now. We're doing yes, it. and you're part of Herstory. Mine is part of Herstory. Right. And um, so, and, and it, it now opens on February 8th. Okay, February Downtown 8th. Downtown St. Paul. 2020. At the mm -hmm. History Theater. Right. And runs through when? March 1st. March 1st. Okay, so what's it been like? You know, now, you, you, you've been wanting to do this story. It started in 19, I mean, you had it something in yeah. 19, now it's 2020, 30 years later, roughly. And here it comes to the St. Paul stage. Well, you know, I had a interesting life. And one day, Norm Coleman asked me to come over to his office because uh -huh. he wanted to talk. All right. I was working for Pam Wheelock at the time in the Planning and Economic Development Department. Okay. And Norm said, I'm thinking about asking you to be my deputy mayor. I said, well, that's great. And he said, but I have one issue. I said, let me guess. I said, since the deputy mayor is the mayor when the mayor is out of town. Oh, okay. If the pride committee comes over and asks me to sign the proclamation. Which he had refused to yes, do. Yes. I won't do it. And he said, well, that's the right answer. But he said, you've worked so hard on that. Why would you do that? And I said, because the charter also says that the deputy mayor serves at the direction of the mayor. And I since I know you wouldn't sign it. I won't sign it either. He said, that's the right answer. And he invited me to become deputy mayor and chief of staff. And suddenly I was a big VIP in City Hall again. And I had my career back. Wow. And uh, there was a, a little minor decade in between those major yeah, events. Yeah, because that was like 1993, 94 then. That I was 98, actually. Oh, 98 that he, uh, okay, because he, he got elected in 93 yeah. or 94, yeah. yeah. So what was that like to sort of, you know, you'd work so hard for the human rights, as you say, and then to say, well, I wouldn't sign the proclamation. So how, how did you reconcile that? Uh, well, it was it was difficult, but it wasn't. I mean, I wasn't. I hadn't been elected the mayor. I wasn't the mayor. I was only okay, the mayor all right. by, so you served at the by the will generosity of, of of Mayor Coleman. So right. that was part of the package. All right. Now I also found it interesting. The Pride Committee never showed up and asked me to sign that proclamation. So I think we had a truce. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, you and I were together when he wouldn't sign the proclamation right, in '93. And you were next door neighbors to him, as I recall. He so was, that was the, another door. wrinkle to the story. He was at the he was at the party where we ta had the first reading of my play. Uh huh. Um, no, we were good friends, and and at the same time, he obviously saw part of the world differently than I did. Yeah. Now, ironically, about three years ago, Norm was an, a paid lobbyist to. Uh, lobby for a national trans-inclusive human rights amendment to the federal law. Are you kidding me? No. He came around? Yeah. What do you think happened? I mean, you know, you, you're more up close and personal than most of us, but how I do you think I have no he, idea. Okay. I, but I he was, really started lobbying. Yeah. Mm. I think it was part of his job. But... Um, <laughs> So you know what part of your so job all you is. Got, yeah. you know, what I take from that is you never know how things are going to turn out. Yeah. Wow. What else do you want us to know about the play? I mean, you can talk about, you know, how, how any interesting parts about having written it or what it's like now to have it come to fruition. I, you know, I, I've been writing the story for 30 years. Right, okay. And I, I, I was writing a memoir and I didn't like the way the memoir was turning out, which right. is a problem since a memoir is your life. Yeah. So if it's not turning out the way you like it, you must not like the way your life is turning <laughs> <Okay>. out. <laughs> and so I had to try to come to terms with that. And it, we were joking. I was, I was on the History Theater board up until the time I became a playwright, and then I had to leave the board. Okay. Um, we were talking about that, and, and, and Ron says, you keep talking about this book when you're going to have it done. And I mm -hmm. said, you know, I wrote a play once. He says, well, let me see it. So he took a look at it and he said, you know, I think we can make a play out of this. Wow. Now, since that time, as I've told him on a couple of occasions, I've never worked 
so hard for a few thousand dollars in my entire life. It is hard work. And I've also, I thought when I came out, when I had that big story in the, in the yeah. St. Paul Dispatch, I thought I'd told it all. Yeah. Nah. Wow. But when you see the play, I haven't left anything on the table. All right, so it's, it, it's, it's all a, there. the all tell all. <laughs> okay, with a lot of, you know, time mixed in between, you yeah. know, where people grow, develop, have insights, hindsights. No. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a few laughs in this play, too. Well, yeah. More than a few. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You know, I remember, you know, you, you briefly mentioned this a little bit, but you went from having, being a very powerful, you know, kind of heterosexual, cisgender, you know, appearing, yeah. white guy. Few and, privileges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then came out as a woman and... I remember asking you back in 92, it was at the Because Conference, and I said, did you lose, what was it like to lose male privilege? And you went, Whoa. So I don't know if you, you know, have any comments on that, but, but, but there was, people talk about privilege and, you know, what, what did you notice about how the world treated you? And what, you know, there were some good things that came out in the paper, but were there, you know, you said there's a darker side. I don't know if you want to say well, anything more about I mean, that. Well, I mean, in some ways, in some ways, I learned that privilege is overrated. Oh, okay. Um, being true to yourself is much more important than being a privileged member of the white male establishment. All right, okay. At the same time, it was often uh, shocking and disturbing and aggravating uh -huh. to, s to discover what it was like to be a woman. And yeah. the biggest, biggest yeah. issue was people don't listen to you the same way. Yeah. And, and, um, it took me a lot of time to get used to that. Yeah. Still takes me time to get used to that. Um, but on balance, the important thing is to be whoever you are. Yeah. To be true to yourself. And, and, and give yourself some time and consideration to figure that out, because it uh -huh. may not be obvious. Yeah. It may, it may take a little while to figure out who you really are on, on all the levels that you have to come out on, you know, come out in life. Yeah. So it's been, it's been highs and lows, goods and bads, um, privileges and lack thereof. Yeah. It's been a, it's been quite a, quite an experience, quite a journey. Yeah. Well, I remember the answer you gave me, one of the answers you gave me at the time, which is now popping into my head was that I never used to think twice about walking down the street at night. Yeah. And now I, I, you know, I'm looking around. Which is kind of like if you ask a room full of 100 women, they're going to say, yeah, when I go out at night, yeah, <laughs> I'm looking around. Yeah, I, and I find, I find that's more true now than it was then. Uh -huh. um, and it was difficult to come to terms with the fact, oh, I probably ought to be careful. Yeah. What do you think, why do you think it feels more pertinent now or more poignant now for you? I don't drive anymore. Oh, okay. So I'm on public transportation. Okay, gotcha. And so I spend a lot of I spend a lot of time with a much broader spectrum of the community okay, than I used sure. to. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. So it it can sometimes be a little nerve wracking. Okay, sure. Sometimes makes you be on your toes. Yep, gotcha. And um, so I find myself. I used to I used to brag that I didn't have to take back tonight because I hadn't given it up, and I've been giving <laughs> quite a bit of it up. Ah, uh, okay. Of late. Okay. So what kinds of things. Uh, I want to just make sure that we give this show due diligence here tonight. So if, if there's anything we missed or haven't talked about or you want the audience to know, what have we missed, if anything? We've got about I, eight minutes here. I guess what I'd really like people to take away and consider is that you have to know who you are. Okay. But then you also have to come to the point where you love yourself. Ooh, Okay. And for me, and this may not be true for everyone who's been through a gender transition, but for me that means falling in love with the person I used to be. Oh, okay. And we, we were in the middle of a, the workshop. We, we did a workshop last winter, and then we did another workshop in the summer. And in the workshop in the summer, I not only started to talk like Bob, but I started being Bob. Oh. And that hadn't happened in years. Oh, my goodness. And I realized that in writing this play, I had reignited sort of his 
being okay. in a way that I hadn't experienced for a long, long time. Wow. And at first it was shocking and disturbing, uh -huh. and then I said, well, welcome back. Because now I'm whole. Oh my goodness, so we just can't cut off a part of ourselves. I, well, I, that, I, I don't like to make prescriptions anymore. Right, I sure. used to find it more easily, prescriptions more easily made than they are now. Yeah, yeah. But for me, that was the case. Wow, so you welcome back Bob. Yeah. And what, what's that like now? I mean, you know, are there some specific times when Bob is present at some, or Bob's spirit, you know, what, whatever that part Every is? Every once in a while, yeah. Yeah, he shows up and, uh, you know, he could be a real jerk. <laughs> he also could be You're very... known as being a little bit irascible. <laughs> <laughs> a little, yeah, a little. You're feisty, you. <laughs> and, but he also could be very kind, uh -huh. very generous. Uh -huh. and, and it's been great to be back in touch with that. Uh -huh. And there is something about, because this, this is the subject I said I didn't want to talk about. All right. But you're a good interview, so you got me talking about it. <laughs> There's something about sexuality uh -huh. for someone who's had my experience. Okay, sure. But you have to come to terms with all of it. Yep. And um, so I don't know where that leads. Uh -huh. And I, if it's going to lead somewhere, you better hurry up because I'm 77 years old now. All right. Uh, but that's been quite a, a rediscovery to uh -huh. sort of own the, my whole person. Okay. Yeah, because I think just hormones give us different kinds of sexual energy. And then aging gives us different kinds of sexual energy, or not. <laughs> I mean, they mean this is going to keep going on? I, doctor, is your, are you counseling me that this is going to keep going on? <laughs> what, what's going to keep going on? <laughs> All these changes and discoveries? Well, I mean, it doesn't yeah, end. you know, our bodies keep doing these things, our psyches <laughs> do these things. I mean, it's kind of like, you know. There we go. Well, I guess... It ain't over till it's over. Didn't Yogi Berra once say that? I think he said that several different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there was another piece of coming to grips with, you know, this, all of your being. Yeah. You know, male energy, female energy, yeah. sexual energy, life energy. The whole business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think for any one of us, but more poignantly as you speak, there are parts of us that we don't want, you know, whatever that part is. It's, it might be associated with shame or, you know, some not me that, but boy, if we don't embrace that, it's going to come out sideways somewhere and probably create problems. So, you know, having the ability to come to a place where that's reconciled and we really truly feel whole is... Pretty special. Yeah, it sure is. Pretty special. It sure is. I also think that you have to own, you know, it's it's great, to, it's great to own the parts of your life you like. Oh yeah, 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 and and put but them on parade, gotta, right? You also got to own the parts of your of your life you don't like so much. Yeah. The the, uh, the darker aspects. Yeah. And um, so it's sort of like this never stops. Yeah. Yeah. Every day is a new day. Yeah. What are you doing these days in addition to, you know, you got this uh, show that's coming up, your, your dream came true as a playwright? Well, you know, I, uh, I, I go into rehearsals on the 14th of this month. Okay. And I'm suddenly going to have a full-time job for the first time in about seven or eight years. Oh, okay. And so see like, what happens. How did I ever? How did I ever work a job into my life? You yeah. Know? So it's going to be interesting to see what that's like again. Uh huh. And and it's and uh, and it's working nights. Okay. Because the rehearsals are at night. Okay. And uh, plays are at night for the most part. There, there are some matinees. Uh huh. But it's going to be interesting to be back at work, day in and day out for the first time in years. So we'll see what that's like. Yeah. And I, this is something we didn't say, but I think is important for the audience to know, is that the person who is playing Susan Kimberly and you is a yeah. transgender woman, Freya Richmond. Yes, that's right. What's that like? I mean, you've been in rehearsals a little bit, I'm guessing, or you've talked with Freya, Freya to have somebody else doing your life. Freya is the only member of the cast that's going to be in the production cast that was in the reading cast from a year ago. Okay. So Freya and I have spent a good deal of time together. Okay. 
Uh, Freya's a very talented uh, woman, uh -huh. and um, and yet it is it is interesting to see someone being you. Yeah. Or, or yeah, because she's got to sit with you, you and try to do your mannerisms and <laughs> yeah. you know whatever. Yeah. And and I think sometimes for her that's a struggle, and sometimes she does it very well. Uh huh. Um, she uh, lobbied to have the beginning of the play, which was a monologue that Bob did, right. to have her as a participant. And it was a brilliant idea. I'm, I'm really glad she pushed. Uh -huh. And so now the play opens with Bob and Susan in their first conversation. But this is a conversation during a tough period of time where they didn't like each other all Ooh, that much. Okay. And so it's very interesting to see her and Bob sort of mm -hmm, and bring the play into life. Wow. So uh, the uh, opening of the play is is, uh, is pretty exciting. It's what Ron Pluso, I think, bought the opening. I'm not even sure if he read the rest of the play. He liked the opening. All right, well, that's what grabs us uh, as He liked an the audience. opening, and so, so it's, now, it's now Bob and Susan having this conversation. Well, we on the Bi Cities cast are planning on coming to one of those times. So Good. Maybe we'll run into you, maybe we won't. But we are coming down the home stretch here with our time. But let me just say, um, this is a play at the uh, History Theater, Herstory Theater in St. Paul, uh, February 8th, 2020 to March 1st, 2020, uh, from? It's from February 8th okay. through March 1st. It's on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, okay. Sunday afternoons, and then there's some other matinees mixed in. And this is? Superman becomes Lois Lane. You got it. Susan Kimberly, you know, our thanks to you. I mean, this is wonderful that we can do your play, but you have been such an instrumental, incredible person. And without you, St. Paul would not have been the first city in the United States to cover people and against discrimination on gender identity. Oh, thank you. So you and I sat in that room and crafted that language, but you know, we really, owe a lot of uh, gratitude and indebtedness to you for being you and for making that happen. And now we get to see your life. I'm not taking no for an answer. Yeah, bingo, bingo. <laughs> well, Susan, would you join me in our signature goodbye? I'll do my best. Looking at this camera and bye for now. Bye for now.